So, lovely to be here today. Um, thanks, Britannic, for inviting me. So, yes, I'm going to talk to you about a subject matter that probably is quite close to some of your hearts um, and probably keeps some of you awake at night. Um, I have said that red bull and matchsticks are available, but I'm glad you've all just had a coffee break. But I will try and keep it brief. Um, so, just in terms of who I am, I'm Neris Caulfield. I uh, run an independent consultancy, injection consulting. I've sort of spent the last 18 years on the floor running contact centre services um, for some of the UK's best, most responsive outsourcers who've all been members of the DMA, so have always adhered to the um, code of practice. I work for various other clients as well um, as an ex-practitioner, but one of my main clients is Mitel, who I'm doing work on around their contact centre proposition um, and making it a, a uh, you know, appropriate to the different verticals. So, the reason I'm here today is because that there's lots of changes going on with regulation, both from an ICO perspective uh, and data processing perspective, and then from the outbound dialing perspective, as, as Danny uh, mentioned earlier. So, um, I'm hoping that if it's not already high on your agenda, uh, depending on how you use data and process it, then can take some of this away to your business and start thinking about it um, in about 25 minutes and ask questions as we're going along. Can't promise I'll be able to answer them, but I will take them away and get answers for you if I can't. So the original Data Protection Act was put in 1998. Now, that, that was when Tom Hanks was saving Private Ryan, Shear believed Nobody believed Obama, uh, not Obama, oh God, he wouldn't do that. Nobody <laughs> believed Clinton at all, and, and StarTex were, um, StarTex were like really cutting edge mobiles. Mm. But it also, the data was small, we weren't in a world of Alex's where data was big. You know, you were putting your databases in access and those types of things. Um, information networks were a lot more straightforward. Technology options were basic. If you wanted to get hold of a customer, you just picked up the phone, and that was it. Um, and uh, we were just doing our own thing. So it's uh, our rules, our data protection rules are just for the UK. That makes it quite difficult to, into, uh, to now we're much more cross-border, and particularly across Europe. Um, and um, also, consumers weren't as savvy they would just quite freely give their data and weren't really aware of the implications of, of not, uh, of data protection and what the breaches would and could mean to them. Um, and just as an overview of the data protection regulations, these are rubbish slides by the way, just very quickly, I'll, I'll just have to do this and then they come up again. Right, stop. There's eight guiding principles, it's all around processing data fairly and equitably, um, and it's uh, for the data controller, who are the people who have to register with the ICO, who most of you will be data controllers. Data processes include your outsource providers at the moment and your cloud provider, and cloud providers are, are also data processors. And um, it's, it's all around this processing of, of personal data and personal data at the moment means uh, your email address, your telephone number, um, anything that can be attributed to you, and that includes your face, which is why when you're going down the motorway, they tell you that um, you're about to have, uh, you know, the speed cameras are coming up because you are identifiable by your face. So that's data protection in action. Let's see, we do this again. So, um, the. The consumer is becoming more savvy, and data, the Direct Marketing Association, if you, I think there's a few members in the room, but if you aren't members, we're the trade body associated with lobbying for best practice. Um, but So we've been quite close to quite a lot of these cases. Um, and this is making public awareness uh, much greater, and it's also making cus uh, brands and clients feel that they absolutely have to understand what is going on. There's, David Lammy, who really shouldn't be getting done and penalised £5,000, sent 34,000 text messages out trying to ask people to go and vote for him, but he didn't have the right opt-in permissions. I mean, this is where groupthink mentality absolutely comes into play, and the charities and the fundraisers have been burnt so badly in the last 
12 months as a consequence of this groupthink mentality. They thought they knew the regulations. They all spoke to each other. Oh, no, we have got a soft opt-in. It's fine, it's fine. No, they didn't. And they didn't, and they got hurt. And now people like British Red Cross have had to say, yes, we're going to go for explicit opt-in, which for their fundraising efforts is going to impact them without a doubt. So um, because of all that backdrop, the European Union and all the 27 member states within it are now working together in trialogue negotiations to pull together a regulation that is going to be um, legislative. It's not directive, so it doesn't have to go through government once it's passed. It will be a directive. Um, and it's a long, long time to get where we are at the moment. But we really are getting closer now. So it's um, the official text. It's all just being done in the different languages at the moment to make sure that they're fully aligned. And it's expected that um, it's going to be published um, in summer 2016. And they'll come into force in 2018. Now, that seems like a long way away, but it really isn't that far away. Um, particularly with some of the some of the companies that are dealing with huge amounts of data. So, what are the big changes within GDPR? Well, this first bit got um, tussled over an awful lot. Consent has, has to be given unambiguously, not explicitly, which was what it was originally. Because Germany, it's they are they don't do outbound in Germany because well, they just don't. Um, because of explicit content, consent, but they've moved it back to unambiguously. So, um, and it can't be implied through inaction. So how are you going to prove that your customers that you're speaking to on an outbound engagement want that engagement and, and are very clear that that engagement is going to happen? So again, going back to the fundraisers, they thought because somebody donated seven years ago that they could give them a call for fundraising and say, would you like to donate again? We're in crisis or what, whatever. And that, that inaction is not, um, that can't be implied as, uh, as um, consent. So more information is going to need to be provided about your data processing activities. So, and interestingly, one of the things is that's still not very clear, but is around uh, profiling. So if you think profiling, you know, if you use your Cameo classifications or your Mosaic pro, uh, classifications on your data to treat customers differently, depending on whether they're high lifetime value or low lifetime value, you're going to have to tell your customers that you're going to do that. And potentially, you're going to have to tell your customers that you're going to prioritize them in the IVR queue and you're going to give them last agent, um, last known agent, if, that's the, if that is what you do in your customer journey. So it's quite an interesting dynamic shift in terms of being open with your customers and being very clear on how you're going to interact with them. Um, data security breaches, policies and processes need to be in place. So if you have a data breach, you have to uh, report it to the ICO now within 72 hours. That gives you very little time and that then becomes public information obviously that anybody can go onto the ICO's website. It happens in America. They're going to they're gonna see who is breaching their data. But however low level it is, obviously we only get to hear really about the ones that are, are big high level breaches. But irrespect now, any data breaches will be published on the ICO data, uh, website. Um, it has to be built into projects for the start. So you, you IT guys, this is all around you, you know, your infrastructure and how you're going to get that, um, those data breaches and policies in place. Subject access requests are currently, there's a few barriers to doing them. So you have to pay £10 if you want a company to tell you everything that they know about you and what they've got on you. And if you're in the, this person's got a lot of money and is going to spend a lot of money with us category, or, you know, or actually let's not bother sending this person much or, or engaging with them very much. That is, is not a very known process and it takes, I think it's, you've got three months or something like that. They're suggesting now that, that A, that's definitely going to be free, but it's going to be sort of 24 hours that you've got to get that subject access request back to those businesses, that, those individuals. So with public becoming aware of that, you might be peppered with a lot of tell me what you know about me. Um, data protection officers. 
there's a bit of ambiguity about this one, but certainly data controllers, most likely data processors, because they are going to be seen as the same, are going to have to designate a data protection officer. And there's, it's basically if you've got, if you are processing significant amounts of data. So I would suggest that almost everybody um, in this room, certainly having uh, looked at uh, 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 the companies that you represent, will have to have a, a, a data officer designated. Um, the length of time the data is kept for, again, you have to be very clear, and there's going to be rules around um, keeping data. And it now includes, personal data is now going to include, include permanent <laughs> IP addresses, device identify, identifiers, and RFIDs. So all that now comes under personal data, which means your cookie policies will probably have to change. Um, yeah, so that's an interesting shift as well. And when you have a subject access request, you're going to have to bring that data back to the person as well. And, and the credit card information is considered as well. Yes, yes. Which was always a grey area. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, and the right to erasure, uh, right to be forgotten. This is currently still only across Google, but if you want somebody to not be talking about you or not show up, um, yeah, you've got the right to, to request that and all uh, history of you on that, on that browser will be wiped. So that's the big changes. And the people responsible, so um, Chris Graham, the uh, commissioner, and Simon Entwistle, the CEO, are um, very excited because they're going to have a l big teeth now. As you know, I don't know if you know, but the DCMS Department for Culture, um, Media and Sport are the people that look after data protection. And Baroness Neville Rolf has been very vociferous in the last um, couple of months, particularly around the fundraising and the way she wants data protection to go. So one of my roles as chair of the DMA Council is to start working with her and explaining, uh, well, yeah, just a bit of PR really. It's not, you know, there's 734,000 agents that work in contact centres and 6,000 contact centres. It's, it's, it, there's some really good reasons why contact centre activity should stay at the heart of customer engagement. But they have got much, much um, bigger teeth now. They are going to be able to fine you up to £10 million for data breaches or 4% of, of turnover. So that is, that is so significant to some businesses and um, certainly, yeah, it, it's frightening some boards out there. So what you need to do um, now, I would suggest, is review your private policies and training. So your agents, they obviously mostly go on, so they won't go on the calling floors without having done a data protection app test. And they all, I'm sure, um, carry out data protection questioning um, when they uh, start engaging with a, one of your customers. But have a look at that and make sure that it's absolutely tight. Look at your privacy notices. So these are your external facing privacy notices. There's loads of guidance about what that should and could look like for going forward. Because of course, if you do it now, if you start getting your external privacy notices in place and making um, your consumer base and your prospective consumer base happy to talk to you now, you don't need to worry in 2018. You've already established that relationship. They're already very clear on how you intend to use um, their data. Then, um, yeah, think about how you're going to process the, the quick turnaround of uh, subject access requests, data protection notifications, all your data security standards will need to be um, looked at because, of course, the ICO, when they come in, they're going to be asking for all your documentation. So really, really tight documentation around how you process it, uh, how your data security standards are in place. And they might not just say, oh, it's okay, you've got an ISO 27001, 9001, that's okay, you're obviously, they will look at it and they will um, address your documentation. Your data processing contracts with all third parties, the Guardian, there's so many businesses that have been caught out by using outsourcers who they thought were doing the best thing and it turns out they didn't. And they just handed that responsibility off. Well, they're the data controller, they can't just hand it off. Yes, those data processes should have been doing the right thing, 
but there's too many examples of where that wasn't the case. So um, cookie consent is going to need to be reviewed because of the IP um, situation and thinking about how you're going to scratch records because you're not allowed to be keeping them just forever and ever and ever, or even for sometimes six months if it doesn't make sense to the type of engagement that you have with that customer. So that's where we are with GDPR. Any questions on that? No? Okay, and then Ofcom I'll go into now. Now I am not against outbound. I have run some lovely outbound campaigns for Vodafone, welcome calls, health check calls, don't leave us calls, for um, uh, charities, for post, after you've had a test drive in the new Touareg. It's outbound, without a doubt, works in the right context. Um, so Ofcom, it's looking like, I spoke to them yesterday, it's looking like um, it's going to be towards the end of May, early June, that the new um, uh, uh, regulatory uh, um, text is going to come out. They've had an absolute swathe of people trying to say, this is really, really serious. If this is what you mean, that well, what they mean is <coughs> callers aren't allowed, to, you're not allowed to make more than three abandoned calls. So we're talking, Danny was explaining earlier about the difference between silent calls. Silent calls have always been a no-no. Abandoned calls is where you make an automated message to say you've been called today by duh, duh, duh. If you want to call us back, that's all going to go out the window. Um, so, and once it does, it, they're giving eight, two months to get right things in place. So if you've got a predictive dialer now, it's going to go out the window in two months. So that means you've got to make a decision as to, right, that, that, that predictive dialer is giving me 30% efficiency. So if I've got a team of 100, I've now got to train another 30 agents to deliver the same returns as I was delivering before the dialer regulations came in. And my training times are 12 weeks. Don't, th yeah, they recognize that they haven't entirely thought it all through. But because of all this um, public, uh, yeah, the Daily Mail, um, predictive dialers look like they're going to be put in the bin. Um, so, <laughs> and big fines are coming out as well. It's interesting, I did this last week, uh, this slide deck, deliver say I will soon be law, and of course it did come in yesterday that it's law, but that has been DMA best practice guidelines for years. So if you haven't and you aren't, and yeah, CLIs need to be being presented to customers. Because of course, Best practice means that the roads will be, that there'll be a much clearer line between those that are doing bad practice versus those that are doing good practice, and then the consumers can, can easily see that difference. So consider your outbound dialing activity in terms of what you need to do and changing the rules. Future proof your dialing dialer to make sure it's compliant with PECA, Ofcom, and GDPR all of those regulations. PECA hasn't changed yet, that's the bit around your um, email engagement, your SMS, and your digital engagements, but it is likely once GDPR comes out, PECA will follow. Um, and so changes will be made there. Think, uh, seek support from experts if you don't have the resources internally. Don't group think, don't just, yeah, don't misinterpret uh, the rules because as you see, it's not the dark satanic mills that are getting set fines of £750,000. These are people who are making decisions that they think are the right decisions, but they're not. And then they're getting serious fines. Um, and then think about moving beyond regulation into best practice. And I would say that's where it comes into play, where you say, actually, consumers, I'm going to be absolutely open and honest with you about how it is we intend to, what our communications <coughs> plans are, and how we intend to have a value exchange and uh, make the most out of our relationship. And that does mean I'm going to call you this amount of time, I'm going to send you this many emails. Just be as, as open and honest as you can be. And that's it. That's the whistle-stop talk. Is that okay? Thank you.